someone like Peter doesn't, um, he would admit this himself, I think, doesn't follow his principles to their absolute logical conclusion. Is our emphasis on human agency over inaction a fantasy to justify our moral negligence? In other words, do we keep banging on about action, you know, because dealing with the inaction is, uh, is tricky and uh, we get off the hook more easily if we just focus on, on action. So uh, we can go in any order now. We'll try and make this, or at least I'll try and make it more of a conversation than a kind of series of just talking heads. But um, I don't know, Julian, do you want to maybe pick that up and, and have a go at that? Yeah, well, I, 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 don't, I, I don't think the inaction action thing is, is the key factor here. I, yeah. I don't get back, back onto this. I mean, I think we're used to, so for example, what is the thing at the moment which perhaps most people are morally outraged about? Our failure to tackle climate change. So the idea that inaction is morally reprehensible is absolutely center stage. We're, we're very, very familiar with that. I think the, the, the question about, you know, we like, it is true that we like to get off the hook and sometimes it is true, sort of thinking, well, it's, I, I didn't do it, it's nothing to do with me, is uh, a way of doing that. But there are lots of other things as well. Lack of proximity is, is a key one. So again, if we take Sophie's example here, you know, the, the, the child labor at uh, the, the end of the supply chain, well, you know, I, I buy something, I'm part of a chain of action which has at the end of it, the, the child labor. When you buy cheap coffee, cheap chocolate, you are, again, you are actively doing something. You are contributing to a supply chain which is, ends in sort of a misery for farmers and people like that. Um, so I just think that we're very familiar with the idea of, um, when, when we try to let ourselves off the hook, I don't think appealing to the fact that inaction involved is, is it's something we sometimes do, but any way we find to distance ourselves from the consequences of our action or inaction, we, we, will, we will often latch onto. And that's the bigger problem rather than action, inaction per se, I think. It's interesting you said proximity and you talked about supply chains. I wondered if you were going to make the argument you didn't make, which is it depends how long the supply chain is. You know, the longer it is, the more complex, the more we get off the hook. I'm sure you challenge that though, Sophie. What, in terms of the longer the supply chain, the more, the, the greater the distance, the less moral responsibility? Yeah, sorry, no. I, um, I think um, it is, it's an interesting question. I actually, I actually read this sort of issue of, is this, is this responding to a fantasy? I, I slightly differently. I thought, you know, maybe it was asking if it's a fantasy that we've really got human agency. Because if you take the supply chain, for example, well, actually we could start saying, well, do you know what, we are, we are just, mired in this sort of global now everything we do our entire lives every, you know sort of every step we turn we would have to be you know sort of really crazy out in the desert living in a kind of in a sort of teepee of our own fashioning to not participate in this world so rather and so then you might want to go on to the conversation well how much agency do i really have how much choice do i really have and that's before you don't need to be a sort of fully fledged marxist to say that it's all these great sort of social forces manipulating me making me do this that and the other but i wonder if there isn't a space between billy crazy in the desert and full-blown everything's been determined for me and this sort of notion of whether actually there's a lot of intellectual work that we could all be doing about the amounts of choices that we can we can be making. I mean, the, the global supply chain is an issue. Um, there are certain things that it would be very difficult to disentangle from our modern lives, but something like clothing, how is that? Is that difficult? Is it difficult to say, right, well, I'm going to buy predominantly secondhand clothes, you know, I'm going to make a positive decision to do that. Or, you know, I suppose it is about coming back to having a look at what you do have to work with without saying that you've got full and complete agency to determine absolutely everything you do. So it's that sort of, I suppose I'd like to throw negotiated actions mm -hmm. into this mixture. Okay, thank you. And maybe we'll pick up on that. Actually, Peter, I wondered uh, about your thoughts. I, I'm taken with your notion of the person living in the desert. And Peter, I mean, I'm sure in your work, you've explored this theme. You know, is that just a fantasy that there is somewhere we could go to be completely off grid and completely non culpable in any way of any sort of moral implication or negative moral implication of our actions? Uh, you could probably do it if you tried hard enough, but I'm not sure that that's the best thing to do because then you're not going to be presumably 
uh, earning as much as you would if you were part of this society. And therefore, you're foregoing the opportunity to contribute to one of the highly effective charities who are helping people in extreme poverty. Um, and I think we do have agency. I mean, the supply chain issues are difficult. I agree. It's hard to find out whether your clothes did involve child labor or uh, labor of Uyghurs in China, for example, something like that. It's, that requires quite a lot of investigation. But it's, you know, anybody who's middle class or above in a country like the United Kingdom or the United States or Australia um, has spare resources that they can contribute to effective organizations. And thanks to the work of the effective altruism movement, you can now go online. Um, you can go to The Life You Can Save, if you like, which is a, uh, a website, an organization that I founded, or you can go to GiveWell or others, um, and you can find the independently assessed charities that have been uh, determined to be highly effective in taking your donation and helping people in extreme poverty in a, in a variety of ways, uh, maybe giving out bed nets so children don't die of malaria, maybe um, restoring sight in people who have cataracts and can't afford to get them removed, uh, a whole lot of different things. So I think we, we do have agency and I don't think we should go and live in the desert. I think we should do our best to contribute to change through our personal donations and of course, through our political activity as well in, in democracies, we can help to make a change that way. Well, I feel a bit like a presenter on the Today Show trying to get a fierce argument going. And, and yet there's sort of quite broad agreement here that we, we, should, we should all sort of do our best here. So I'm going to try and provoke, uh, maybe I'll try and provoke you, Julian, and say, <laughs> look, surely we can't be such goody goodies all the time, can we? Yeah, no, no. I mean, I think there is, I do have disagreement. Um, and I think the disagreement is this, is that I think the kind of approach that Peter advocates, which he's only sort of begun to sort of sketch out, so it's not something he's overtly said today, really takes as its premise the idea that when we're thinking about what our moral responsibilities are, we have a duty to kind of consider everybody's interests absolutely equally with no, with no favour at all. So the fact that someone is um, your neighbour, uh, a member of your family and so forth, there may be pragmatic reasons why you would spend more time helping them than people on the other side of the world, Namely, that you're there, you're available. So there are practical reasons. That's not a principle. In principle, our responsibilities are equally the same to everybody. And I, I, I don't think that that's sustainable. I think that it sort of has it has a view of human nature and society, which is um, I don't think it's, it, I don't think it's an accurate view of human nature and society. I think that the duties and responsibilities we have are often a result of historical, even geographical political accidents and these 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 responsibilities do not extend universally now the point is I, I could argue that point in a philosophical nitpicking way and I'd probably you know Peter's a, a great man he'd probably destroy me but um in a way I wouldn't even want to because I think you don't need to because in practice I think we tend to converge in practice someone like Peter doesn't um, he would admit this himself, I think, doesn't follow his principles to their absolute logical conclusion. Ah. Peter does not live literally on the minimum that he could survive on, um, any less than which he'd become miserable. Um, he is very, very generous indeed. He gives away a lot of money. He won the £1 million Bagruan Prize last year, gave it all away. So he's, he, he does, he, he's a mu you know, much more altruistic person than I will ever be. So I'm not being critical, but... In practice, no one can really live the way that Peter advocates. It's an ideal he aspires to. I don't think we need to have the unrealistic ideal in order to say, in virtue of being part of an interconnected world, where you know, we can no longer pretend that our actions only affect our neighbours and the people in our street. We have much, much greater responsibility towards you know, the people in the supply chains, people in the developing world, than, than we think we have. But to say we have exactly the same responsibility as to everyone, I think that undermines the, the special nature of the relationships we have with certain people, family, friends, community, and okay. so forth. Um, Peter, it's not my job to look after your feelings, but I'm just wondering after that, uh, whether you're feeling more condemned or praised and whether you feel like you've been characterized more as a man of principle or not. Uh, look, I mean, what Julian said is quite, Right, you know, I don't live uh, at that absolute limit of what I could give away. Um, and uh, I think Julian is also right that human nature, to a significant degree, goes against the ideal that I've been putting out there. But what I'm trying to do is to encourage people to do more um, and 
to that extent, despite you're trying to get a disagreement between me and Julian, it's not really that clear cut because, <laughs> um, you know, I'm trying to push people in this direction. And I um, am certainly prepared to say that if Julian is saying we should do more, then we're allied on, on that issue. Yeah. The question is really just uh, what's the best way to get people to try and push against those natural impulses that we have to a certain degree, but I don't expect and I wouldn't myself um, you know, assume people can be completely impartial between their spouses, their parents, their children, um, and and distant strangers. Yeah. Okay, um, Sophie. Well, in a second, we'll move on to the next question. But I, I'd love you to respond to this again. I'll, I'll try and up the ante a, a little bit here. But you know, Julian's basically saying we should have a rank order of people we should help. That who would be on your top of your list? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well. Um, yeah, it's an it's an interesting. I, I actually I do have a sort of quite serious point about this because, and it might be in slight um, differentiation because, whilst obviously um, you have to kind of work in the situation you're in, but and therefore if what you can do is give money to certain charities and you know that is how you're going to register a general vague broad solidarity with the world sort of thing, that's good. But where does that come from? I wonder if it comes from up here. You know, you're, that, that's a sort of, you know, you are, you're doing a sort of taking a reasoned approach to this. I think it is a generally good thing to be on the, the side of humanity. I'm interested in um, Julian's elderly parents, that emotional entanglement, really, that sort of kind of drops away some of the language about, you know, moral decision making. It's not a moral decision. You have to do it. And that really, you know, that sense of being, I, I guess I'm curious and I'd be interested to know what, um, Peter and Julian think about, you know, where is this in that picture? Like how we are, are we able to really feel for that, ch this, this poor hypothetical child that we're picking on whose life is already hard enough, but who has become the subject of, of our, of our conversation? Like, how do we sort of restore that kind of emotional energy that makes it not even a question of, you know, sort of ethical auditing if you like like well i can do this and i should do this and by the time it's more practical for me to do this and that kind of neat balance sheet of choices um where does that kind of uh, and this come, brings me back to the apathy issue i suppose it's like what was going on with there why why weren't all those young people in the mid 50s later on obviously that changed but why weren't they all getting furious about the bomb maybe they were but maybe there was a sort of degree of which, you know, we are living in a world which makes it very easy to become emotionally paralyzed a lot of the time. There's only so much crap we can take thing after thing after thing after thing. And it's like, that's actually to me an extremely dangerous situation to get into because if morality and ethics becomes purely a matter of accounting, I, I don't think that's a very, I don't think that's a very promising future. Mm, okay. Um, thank you. I've got, there are sort of two other key questions that we're going to try and focus in before opening out to questions, which are developments really of where we've already been. Um, first of these is, so would emphasizing the failure to act lead to a fairer society for all? In other words, we, you know, if we really called out inaction, um, which of the three of you would like to have a go at this first? Um, no. Well, I'd like to say, inaction. Okay. yes, if, if I, if oh, I yes, Peter, go ahead. Uh, I think, we're gonna have inaction I, I think it would lead to a fairer society, yes, because I think uh, it's the inaction that's, you know, there's this huge disparity we're all very aware of between uh, the low-income countries and particularly those in extreme poverty in the low-income countries um, and, uh, as I say, those who are middle class or above in affluent countries. Um, and yet we most people are doing very little. So I think if we um, got rid of or, or lessened at least I kind of agree we can't get rid of it entirely but if we lessen this divide between action and inaction that would change and, and Julian mentioned climate change and that's that's a really good example um, because in, well in fact maybe it's it's a case where we're not seeing our thing what we're doing as actions right but but when we emit greenhouse gases we are harming people um, but we think totally differently of that we don't have the you know, Sophie was talking about the emotional responses. If if you went to somebody in a distant country and and punched them in the face so that they you know were really badly hurt, um, everybody would say that was a horrendous thing to do. If you emit greenhouse gases, that might mean that they can no longer produce crops because there there's a drought or their land is flooded or it's too hot to work and at the harvest time. Um, you know that we don't attribute uh, responsibility for in in the same way. Yeah. 
Um, it's interesting. It made me think. You know, we have crimes of neglect. I'm talking about you know childcare and families earlier, but we don't have crimes of neglect at least yet, necessarily with regard to the climate. What, what were you thinking, Sophie? No, I think this um, this this concept of moral estrangement is a is a sort of um, really interesting one for me. And this notion of whether if we then started taking tougher stances on inaction, what what would happen to that? Would it would it exacerbate it or would it ameliorate it? And honestly, I mean, it is going to be a very contextual thing. So something like the climate change, yes, absolutely. You know, that, that I, I don't think you could make sort of broad generalizations for that issue. Absolutely. But for other issues, my worry is who's doing the deciding about what actions are good and desirable and how they what they are who should be taking them in to what degree and who's deciding which inactions are punishable and by what means and how exactly and i'm very i'm very very worried about unless this is an utterly kind of democratic in the fullest and strongest sense of that term conversation then um that is a kind of that is an additional feature of an increasingly sort of punitive interventionist political s state which is already judging individuals very 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 strongly very harshly in a very um in invasive way mm. okay what are you thinking well about? i mean I, I'm, th I'm thinking that again I, I think the whole inaction action thing is actually it's a difficult concept it, it, it depends on the framing so it's interesting you know peter was talking about climate change in action, and then he said, well, actually, we've got to see it as being mainly about action. We're pumping the gases out, etc." The very same thing can be framed as an action or inaction. If I don't give food to my children, am I starving them? That sounds like an action. Or am I letting them starve, right? I mean, it's semantic, isn't it? I actually think if you emphasize inaction, I don't think that's going to get to people as much as if you rather draw attention to the consequences of their actions. And the other thing is, it's not so much inaction that's a problem as the refusal to kind of change the actions we have. So I think what people have to recognize is that we are constantly engaged in actions, every day in actions, where we invest our pensions, where we buy our food. Um, and it's not just about the consumer end as well. I think that's a big mistake to think the key to this is just make sure you spend your money in the right way. You know, the, the things that we take to be political priorities and so forth. You know, a lot of the, the harms that are done in the world are because it is set up in a certain way where certain actions are taken to be the norm, they have the consequences, and they're not being challenged. So it's switching from one set of actions to another rather than sort of like saying you're not doing enough, right? We're doing, we're, we're, the, the kind of things that Peter's concerned about are often the consequence of, of actual um, actions that have been done, historical actions, colonial actions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They're not just people aren't starving simply because no one's bothered to do anything. It's often because they have bothered to do something. They just bothered to do the things which are highly extractive and highly harmful and highly unfair. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.